right, I think we are live. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Hey, Jay. Good morning. Hey, we're great. Hey, Jay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, let's get started um, as people start to drill in. If we could just do a quick introduction of everyone that's present today, um, just so that everyone can know kind of who we are, what we do, um, what general experience we have. Right. So I'm Jessica. I am a software developer here um, at IL. Hi, I'm Perry, and I'm a senior oh, consultant. Hey, what? Excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Wyatt. <laughs> I'm a senior consultant at uh, Industrial Watch. Fantastic. Um, and as you all know, I'm Jay Mansare, a product coach at Industrial Logic. Um, thanks for joining today. This should be a fun conversation. Um, the topic. Perry, is Perry didn't introduce. I oh, didn't you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Perry Reed. I'm uh, also a, a senior consultant with Industrial Logic. Nice. Thank you, Perry. Um, no, thank you all for logging on today and having this conversation. I think the topic's really important. It's something that we come across a lot. Um, shielding developers from users, right? So unlocking value with inner collaboration. Do one of you kind of want to expound on what that means in general? Go for it, Perry. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, what, what's interesting is uh, we've seen this pattern over and over again where uh, developers are kind of put in a little bubble and they're, they're isolated. They're, um, they're really not allowed in many cases to interact directly with the, the users. And uh, it's often done with, you know, some sense of that this is somehow better, better for someone, but we're not sure. But, and, and my experience, and I know in, uh, you know, Wyatt and Jessica's experience, um, it's it's not a good move. It's not a good way to work. And so we've uh, very excited to talk about this because we feel like um, uh, having developers have access and interact directly with users yields many benefits. And we'll be able to talk about that as we go. Absolutely. And so jumping right into it, and also I just want to make a side note, if you're joined, if you're just joining the live or as you join the live, if you have any comments, questions on the topic in general or anything that you hear any, any of the panelists mention, please feel free to drop it in the comment section um, and we will do our best to address it during the conversation. Um, so I guess leading into that, Perry, you mentioned that it's fairly common. What types of organizations in you all in you all's experience? Um, have this practice where you have the separation between developers and the end user? Well, I know I've seen it in, in companies of all different sizes, and I've, I've worked in many of those um, over, the, over the years and decades. And, um, you know, what I find is that, that uh, you know, the, the practice is often, sometimes it's a, a, a convenience uh, kind of thing where maybe the, the organization itself doesn't have um, convenient access to whoever their users are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you begin to see practices like um, inserting proxies for the customer that take various forms and shapes. Um, but sometimes it's a belief that the, that somehow developers are not adequately skilled to inter interact with, uh, with the customer. Right. And there so seems to be this uh, stereotype or attitude towards developers as if uh, they can't speak to people, they can't communicate, they need to have their head down in the basement coding and that's it, that's all they do. So we should we should shield them, but that's that's completely wrong. I mean, we're complex beings, you know, and, any, and anybody can learn, anybody can Here's learn how. to communicate. It's a skill, right? It's a skill, yeah, exactly, just like, any other skill and, and you know, uh, developers probably more than, than others, we've acquired the ability to learn lots of skills because <laughs> we have to. So, um, you know, but communication is a, is a critical skill. And the more that, you know, a developer has grown uh, or grows those particular kinds of communication skills, not only do they become a better professional, mm -hmm. but they yield, it yields better results. So. Yeah, yeah big time. Yes, sir. So, so all of that is true. And I, I'd like to add that I've seen situations a number of times 
where the product owner, product manager, um, stakeholders, they have the, re I should say the product manager has the relationship with the stakeholders or the users. And um, there might be some fear in the engineering team having direct interface with the user or the stakeholder. Um, some things come to mind, uh, experiences where the product owner made promises to the users like years ago. And um, there may be a fear of that information floating to the surface of some of those promises are uh, not practical or different ways of, of working to provide some solutions for, you know, the, the customer. So just saying that uh, there's there potentially turf, um, not turf wars, but turf ownership, right? Yeah. So. And there, there, can, there can be some um, truth to sort of managing expectations, like you said, you know, and so uh, you had a, you know, team of uh, 10 developers, you might not want to have 10, 10 different conversations with the same uh, customers. So, you know, coordinating that makes sense. But, uh, you know, one thing that I find over and over again is that in general, the engineering side or the development side of the organization is brought into the conversations much too late, you know, and so they're they're isolated in the idea is that, you know, we'll go talk to the customer, we'll figure out what they want, and then we'll slide it under the door for you guys to take care of. And I think that maybe that's done for a variety of reasons, but, um, you know, I think that's a very um, inefficient way to work. And not only that, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of great ideas come from the engineering team. And a lot of, in that conversation with the customer, uh, I think a lot of it also um, needs to be couched in, in terms of what's reasonable. And then, you know, the whole idea of, of uh, bargain hunting and, and realizing that, you know, maybe what they asked for is possible, but there's this other thing that could be done that's just as good or better. And you get an amplification of what the customer is asking for in ways that maybe they didn't even know that they could ask that question or that they could do it that way. So, you know, again, you could build a case very easily for, for getting the engineering team, the, the developers involved in the conversation with the customers up front. And, you know, there's very little to be gained by shielding them, um, you know, away from that, uh, that interaction. I have, a great, I have a great story that aligns exactly with that. So. Oh, please share. Uh, Jessica was about to say something. Well, yeah, I was just say, of course, you don't want to bombard them with yeah, 15 different people calling at 15 different times, but there are ways that you coordinate that. So you are talking, you're collaborating, you're helping the developer to have empathy to be able to come up with the best solution. Go ahead, Wyatt, let's hear. All right, so, um... We were on a project with a client and um, the product owner had been working with the, the, his stakeholders for a number of years promising this application. <clears throat> and this application was an inventory management system. And so we were tasked with building this application to give visibility to um, his users or the, yeah the, the users the ability to see transport of an item to their area so then they can negotiate with the other dealers in the area um, partners oh. um, so we were trying to understand what are we building because there are all these designs and screens and whatnot. And um, so he said, well, we promised this application more than two years ago and we really need to deliver this. And 
So we said, well, how are they doing it now? Well, right now what they do is they, they, they pick up a phone and they call the main office and they go, I'm looking for this configuration. Is it, is it in the area? Because they don't know, this particular dealer doesn't know what the other dealers have or what's in transport to the dealers. And, and they, they, what they do is they look, look it up on a sheet and they said, they say, it's in transport. It's going to be on the ship. It's going to be at the port, such and such date. And so, and it's going to this dealer. Great. Where are they getting that information? Well, it's over this database, a couple of databases over there. So, so then what we thought was, let's, let's just print out. A, a, a spreadsheet and ship it to them to to the to the dealers so that would be the first step right talking about like evolutionary design or whatever it may be is like this is the first phase of solving this problem and the product owner said no you can't do that we promised this application for the last couple of years we can't send anything else so I can say this guy's names because they're He's probably not doing it. But Pradeep got a wild hair and said, I'm just going to do it anyway. So he he dumped a, a spreadsheet, sent it to all the dealers. We came the next morning. What do you think they said? Oh, my gosh. We've been waiting for this for years. Thank you so much. No screen. But now they can filter and search on their own. They don't have to pick up the phone and call the main office and go, where is this thing? So that that provided them the ability. And had we interfaced with the customer, we would have discovered that sooner. Yeah. And with a simple solution. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a simple solution for right now to get them over the hump. Mm -hmm. Not an application. It was a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And that happened more than one or two or three times. Absolutely, I'm curious because I know we, I know you all mentioned earlier um, situations where maybe the product owners are making certain promises or having certain conversations um, absent of the developers and developers kind of being um, blindsided by certain features or things that have been promised. Um, in situations where developers, because I think this is also a fear, right? I know there, it could be a situation about power imbalance, but also in situations where maybe developers do get closer to the end user, um, but the decision making doesn't fall with them. Do you feel like the developers thinking or feeling they have a better idea or a more effective approach, um, but not necessarily having the deciding power to implement that? Do you feel like it affects the end product? If say the product owner says, "Hey, thank you for that input, but we're not going to move forward with that." Yeah, I think it's always, uh, you know, it's always a business decision about what, you know, what direction they want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, as I, I was saying earlier, uh, if you're only leaning on the developers just to do the coding, you know, you're, you're really missing out about half of the, their value. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of creativity and a lot of imagination and a lot of understanding of the way the product currently works mm -hmm. that they can bring to that conversation and uh, offer suggestions about where it could go. So, it, you know, the engineers, I think, are um, often, you know, the single best source of innovation, but yet they're often not invited to the party. You know, they're not part of that conversation. And, uh, and that's really what this amounts to. And, and, you know, we've been talking about requirements as, a, as an example of where this is missing, but it goes way beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, uh, you know, an experience years ago. I, I was working uh, in an oil and gas uh, company, and I had responsibility for um, a, a bunch of different development teams, and one of them was supporting the drilling operations. Mm -hmm. And the team was um, was working on some features that would be. Um, for applications that would be being used out on the drill rig itself. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of work that was starting to go into this. And at some point we said, 
let's plan a trip. Let's actually go out to the uh, to an active drilling rig. We got had to get permission and special protective equipment and all that to, to be on, on, on the deck. But we went out there to see what the operating environment looked like. And oh my gosh, it was so loud, so chaotic, that typical user interfaces were just not possible. Mm-hmm. And we were already anticipating that, you know, we were going to build an application just like everybody else had ever um, built. And we realized this was not going to work for them at all. So that trip, not only did it clarify what these customers actually need, but it created a sense of empathy within the team for what these particular customers needed to be successful. And they went back and they said, oh, my gosh, we really got to rethink this. We got to be really creative about what the user experience uh, looks and feels like because our traditional thinking is just not going to work here. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand why you're building something. Yeah. It's interesting. I know that you all... Um, obviously, the team at Industrial Logic is amazing. Um, very bright engineers, um, very communicative and collaborative folk. Um, but I think it's been our experience, and correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I think it's been our experience that more times than not, organizations don't work in a hyper collaborative way, right? Like they're not bringing all parties into the conversations. They're not make. They're not really following um, or basing their decisions off of the direct need of the user. Um, and I think there, the reality is to that, that there are a lot of engineers who maybe aren't comfortable or aren't experienced talking to users or collaborating in that way. How do you suggest um, that organization? But to your point, that is there are missing out on a lot of the capabilities of their of their people. Right. So um, how would you suggest or what are some ways that you could think of that organizations can start to build that type of culture or that level of comfortability with their engineers to be able to engage in a way that's beneficial both for the development team and for the users that are participating? You're on mute, Wyatt. Thank you, thank you. So Perry and I have been talking about this most recently. And uh, <clears throat> bottom line is that many, many organizations, it's a, it's about the money, right? Mm-hmm. And keeping people busy, keeping people utilized. Um, so we started working in the last couple of weeks, started working on a spreadsheet to see where uh, where a different way of working, a collaborative way of working, reduces the what we call NVTs, non-value tasks, and the cost of the non-value tasks. And the non-value tasks are the things that happen in between the siloed work, right? So in, in a scatter-gather organization, in a traditional way of working, where I'm doing some work, and then um, I'm a designer and then I pass over the wall and give it to a developer and developer gives it to a test tool. All of these hands off are NVTs. So the way we work, uh, the way IL works is highly collaborative and we're starting to model in a spreadsheet, the difference in dollars over the course of a month, couple months, half a year. <clears throat> the difference of working in the siloed handoff tasks versus working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And Perry and I put together some contrasting ways and we were shocked at some of the efficiency percentages that started to come out when we were collapsing those activities into non-passing into working collaboratively. I mean, it is stunning. And so if we could start if organizations could start seeing the impact of working collaboratively, I, it, it's a no brainer decision. Like we, we saw that and it's like, are you freaking kidding me? It's like, we know it because we work that way, mm-hmm. but we start putting it into data mm. and it, it is real. I mean, it's not, it is tangible dollars. We're not talking about like $10. We're talking about tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. Yeah, over and, and, oh, over the course of a year, with a with a simple team of seven people, 
It's a million dollars savings. Wow. I was just going to ask over what period of time do you think an organization would have to collect data to start to see the impact that it was having on their bottom line or on their organization? Yeah, we started modeling that uh, this week. And it's like, wow. I mean, th that's real. You can go to your finance company and go, look, we're wasting this amount. We're saving this amount. We should experiment and working in a different way. Right. I mean, that's a language that most of us can understand money. Exactly. And so what happens when the developer is shielded and is told to do this thing and they go off and they do all these features and then later after it's developed or delivered to your users, you find out they're not using half of the features that we spent all this time on. Well, what does that time mean? The time mm -hmm. is money. Yeah. yeah. You know, as I was uh, thinking about this this topic, um, I was kind of reflecting on, you know, so what is the real problem? You know, what problem is it that we're trying to solve? And I think fundamentally it is a communications problem. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I was reminded of that, one of my favorite movies, uh, Cool Hand Luke, where the you know, there's a scene where the warden stops everybody, you know, and, and says, you know, what we have here is failure to communicate. And, um, and what I what I found is that um, everything other than us uh, having uh, the development team have direct access to the customers is just a little bit worse, <laughs> and, and it gets a little bit worse and a little bit worse every time uh, we try to patch some other kind of solution into it. You don't have to go any further than the um, you know the principles behind the Agile Manifesto when you go look at that. I think it's the like the uh, fourth principle, it says, you know, the business people and developers uh, must work together daily throughout the process. I mean, that was that to me was always the kind of gold standard. But uh, so many times teams either feel like they can't do that or, or for whatever reason, they begin to adopt some other alternative uh, practice. And it's just a little bit worse and a little bit worse. Like, you know, some things that come to mind is, um, you know, we often find uh, teams putting in some sort of proxy. So I can't talk to the real user. So we're going to let you talk to this proxy and they don't call it a proxy. They, you know, they have a um, more sophisticated name for that. It might be a business analyst. It could be a product manager. It could be a, a, um, even uh, the product owner role. But, you know, in my experience, if that person, if they can't answer simple questions, like, you know, uh, you know, answer direct questions about, what the desired functionality is, or if um, you know they can't clear, clarify quickly what the priorities are, or give you direct feedback without having to go talk to somebody else, then they're, you're definitely dealing with a proxy. They don't really own the responsibility for making those decisions. And um, and then what you have is you know sometimes there's a chain of these proxies, and so the information has to flow through multiple people before it gets to the team. And now you're playing, you know, the, uh, the telephone game or, you know, the Chinese whispers mm -hmm. game. And every step in that chain is an opportunity for the message to get changed just ever so slightly until what's delivered to the team looks nothing like what it did when it started. And so you know, this is where, and, you know, the story you gave uh, a minute ago, Wyatt, you know, is a great example of that where when the team, you know, Kind of cut cut through through uh, the the corners or whatever, and, and gave something directly to the customers. They were thrilled, you know. And um, so there's there's a lot of dysfunction around how communication happens. But I think fundamentally at the at the core of all this, it is a communications problem. I'm curious. You said something that that made me think. You talked about how ideally the business and the development team would work to collaboratively every day, right? At just like some type of regular cadence. Um, and you that's and Wyatt, yeah, ideally. Yeah. Um, and you and Wyatt both mentioned very interesting things in your story. So uh, Perry, if I remember correctly, in your story, you were working with um, people who are working on an oil rig. And Wyatt, in your case, you were working with um, an automotive organization, but you were working, your end user were, develop, were uh, dealers, I believe, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, Again, in an ideal situation, we'd be able to collaborate every single day with our users. And I think maybe 
that sounds extreme to some business stakeholders or to some product owners. Like we can't, as much as we'd like to get as much information from our users as possible, we can't talk to them every day. We can't go out to the oil rig every day. Um, how do you, and I, and I think that's a, that's a legitimate concern, right? For a product owner or a business team to say, Hey, we want to get information from our users, but we also don't want to be a bother to them. How do you determine what that length or what that interval for collaboration is? Well, and I hope you don't mind. I, I start on this. Um, so in our situation, <clears throat> there were many, 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 many um, dealers. And so they actually had a proxy. Um, one of the main, one of the dealers went around and took feedback from the other dealers. So they, so that person represented all the dealers legitimately. Mm -hmm. And so the product owner then interfaced with that individual. Okay. And so... Uh, what we did is that uh, we asked the product own the product owner what what problem are we trying to solve, and so when we sent the file directly to that proxy, and then she then sent it out to the rest of the dealers. That's when we got feedback that what took you so long? Thank you so much, and that opened the door for us to be able to communicate directly with the proxy not through the the product owner now there there is happiness and sadness to the story and the happiness is that we had a direct connection close to the customer the sadness or i should say sadness it was happy too but the unfortunate part is that the product owner was no longer on the team mm. because it was the it was us communicating directly with the the customer essentially in that situation, then what is the value add of the product owner? Um, well, I, I think you can understand what the math is right away. There wasn't any value add except for there was a shield. Now, it's not like that in all situations. But in this situation, this product owner uh, really needed to own that turf. Okay. And by removing that barrier, we went – we going directly to the product person mm -hmm. that allowed us to build things much more quickly mm -hmm. and without a filter because they were, we were getting feedback from them within 24 hours. We started shipping things incrementally, literally every single day, small wow. improvements. So we went from like two years of designing and delivering something where they were doing it before, the, the way they were working before, mm -hmm. to us working in the way that we normally work, which is every day we're going to show you an improvement every single day. And they go, yep, sounds good. Keep that, keep that uh, switch on. And like, oh, no, we're not ready for that. Let's flip that switch off. So we would go back and forth. We have about, we have a little less than two minutes. Um, left on the stream if i remember correctly uh <laughs> do you all have uh do you all have any kind of final thoughts on the subject before we drop uh i'll just say that um you know i i learned many years ago not to uh, underestimate uh the the power and the professionalism of technical people. And I think what they bring to the table in terms of uh, their experience and, and knowledge, not only about the product, I mean, you're, you're talking about people that are maybe be working, that have been working on this product for years mm -hmm. and uh, know it better than any other, nobody else on the planet knows it better. <coughs> and so when it comes to uh, being engaged with the customer about talking about options, uh, they're an immense resource of talent and ideas and innovation, and they should be part of that uh, conversation. Sure. Uh, Jessica, did you have any final thoughts? Yeah. Similarly, um, I think it is so important to include the developers. While you may have an idea that you don't go with, but you might. And it's, if the more people that are collaborating and and feeling the pain, you know, the more ideas, the more brains that are, you know, wheels that are turning, 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 and we can come up with the best solution. 
sure. Wyatt, we have a few seconds left. Do you have anything you wanted to throw in there? No, I told my stories. You know, I just think it's really important that we uh, make every effort to remove the barriers or, you know, the, yeah, the veils, the barriers to get as close to truth right. and uh, as possible, you know, and as quickly as possible. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the whole team bombarding a customer if that's the image, but it should be someone that, that is, um, has ideas and visions of providing solutions that may be less of a big bang. Right. And, and developers have a knack for doing that. Yeah. And I'd say, especially developers today, right? I mean, maybe not back in the 80s or 90s, but uh, yeah, most of us are really in tune to how to deliver things incrementally. At least I feel in the space that we work in. So. Nice. Thank you all so much for this great conversation. Lots of gems in there. Um, thank you, everyone who joined, commented, um, or joined us for this conversation in any way. We have another event coming up next week, um, Rescuing Legacy Software Experiences from the Field. So join us, same time, same place. Again, thank you all, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you.